Hey, hey, hey. Hi, everybody, and welcome to All Night New York City, where we're fighting climate change with XR. I hope you're all staying warm. Uh, I know the winter is upon us. Uh, today, we have a really special meetup, which will be focused on how we can harness XR to fight climate change. And to inspire you, we have four fantastic speakers that are doing just that. So we'll also talk a little bit about the XR Prize Challenge that is offering $100,000 in cash as a cash prize to uh, the winner of this competition, uh, a company or a team that will be able to show the most impact on the fight against climate change. And we are happy, of course, to address your questions about the competition, about how to compete, when, where, and, uh, and how to win. My name is Orin Barr. I am the co-founder of AWE, and I have one question for you. Are you ready to get augmented? Woo! That works so much better in the room with everybody, but I can hear you in your, in your, uh, in your bedrooms or wh wherever you are. All right, let's get started with a quick uh, introduction. Bring up the slides, Goopy. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for um for joining us here on all live there we go um where we have these uh, four fantastic speakers that will walk you through some of the the project they're working on it's just slow okay um so yeah, this is AWE Live, uh, the free online platform for the XR community to learn, connect, and grow. And it hosts a nonstop stream of online XR events like this meetup. And here I want to show you some of the, the meetups we have now around the world. Over 30 cities are now running uh, those meetups. And all of them are hosted right here on AWE Live, so there's no need to look elsewhere. And since you're already here, check out the awesome people on the platform. There are over 10,000 XR professionals on AWE Live, and you can access all of them uh, right here in the people directory on the right. Here are some of the upcoming events on All Live. You can see some great podcasts, webinars, events and of course more all night meetups we have all night northern xr from helsinki coming up soon uh, we just wrapped up uh, our major event series for 2022 with usa event china event and europe and based on your feedback uh it seems like it was pretty awesome we'd love to hear more about those who attended these events and for those who missed it, uh, like you, you can see here, all the recordings from all the sessions are available right here on AWE Live. Uh, if you want to see the, uh, the uh, sessions from the US, uh, go back to uh, on the calendar to June 1st through 3rd, and you can see those sessions as well. Um, a great way to just catch up on things that you might have missed. And now the 2023 se season is uh, about to start. AWUSA 2023 will be back in Santa Clara at the end of May uh, for what I think is going to be the biggest XR event ever. Call for speakers and exhibitors is now open. Just go to awxr.com. And since uh, this meetup is all about fighting climate change, I'm excited to pre-announce today that AWUSA 2023 will be carbon neutral. More on that later on, but we're really proud about this decision and um, the steps that we're taking towards that. And we're counting on your support. Uh, also, the AWE Academy continues to offer several courses in the coming months. You can see more info on awexr.com slash academy, uh, and you can sign up over there. And if you want the latest news about XR in your inbox, you can see here on the bottom, uh, you can sign up to the weekly spatial newsletter. I can tell you it's very spatial. All right, folks, now we're ready to get started with our main topic for tonight. First, 
a little bit more about the XR price challenge. What is it? When is it? How to compete and how to win? So uh, in June at LVUSA, I announced the XR Prize Challenge uh, as an effort to bring together all the brightest minds in XR and the brightest minds in climate change to work together towards finding new solutions to climate change. And we committed $100,000 as a cash prize to the winner of this competition. We received about 100 submissions so far. Uh, these were kind of in the registration phase. And now uh, we are actually opening it up for the actual concept submissions. So uh, if you already submitted, please go back to this URL and resubmit now that you have the complete terms and uh, uh, guidelines for how to compete. So why, why did we do this, uh, this prize? Well, we believe this competition is really super important for everyone, both in the XR industry and climate change experts. We should all pay attention because it's not just about the cash prize. It's really about saving the world. And by the way, it's also the biggest, uh, one of the biggest economic opportunities in the next decade. You know, we're all seeing the impacts of climate change. But sometimes we feel like there isn't enough done. There isn't enough action to fight it. Uh, and like um, climate change activist Solitaire Townsend said, we're in a race between our Megadon and Awesome. If we take action now, our future could still be awesome. But here's the thing, you know, with all the innovation, the movies, the books written about it, you rarely see XR mentioned as a tool to fight climate change. And I'm saying, how come? How is that possible? Now we, in this meeting and in the XR industry, you know better. We, we know that we can change that. We have the superpowers and we aren't afraid to use them. And here are some, four of the, the superpowers of XR that could help in the fight against climate change. Replace. Whenever you use AR or VR, you can replace wasteful material practices. You can reduce travel, you can reduce manufacturing waste, you can reduce the need for real estate spaces. And XR can also visualize, it has the, the superpower to visualize the causes and impacts of climate change. The third superpower is about education. Um, XR has the ability to create empathy and to uh, provide deeper understanding and learning uh, of, of the, uh, the solutions to climate change. And finally, XR can also help optimize the design and execution of existing climate change solutions, make them better, help them uh, help engineer them better, and also maintain them better. So that's really the, these are the, the four categories that we have assigned for this uh, prize competition. Uh, replace, visualize, educate, and optimize. So when you're submitting your concept, think about which category uh, is the best match for what you're submitting. Here are some of the key milestones to keep in mind. Um, concept submissions is now open until the end of December. So there's not much time to waste. Get on it right now. Uh, those who get the thumbs up for their concept submission will be invited to submit an MVP, a minimum, minimum viable product by April. So that will give you a bit of time to actually build the, the concept that you propose and be able to demonstrate it to um, the judges, uh, which will, you know, will select the finalist. And on May 30th uh, in Santa Clara, the finalist will be asked to demo demonstrate their solutions uh, to judges, which will be uh, which will consist of climate experts and NXR experts. And the winners will be announced on June 1st during the Augie Awards ceremony. So these are some of the milestones. We're looking for you. We're looking for you to submit your concepts for the competition. Anyone can practically submit if they have a good good idea. Uh, we're also looking for coaches and mentors to help work with the teams. Um, so especially we're looking for sustainability organizations and experts that can help 
coach teams that are that are bringing the XR expertise with them. And I'm glad to say that we already have six uh, coaches and judges on board that we'll announce uh, very soon. Uh, and we're also looking for technical partners or solution providers that have either tools, software tools or hardware tools that can help the teams uh, build their solutions. So we wanna reduce all the barriers for adoption. And I'm glad to say that we have already 14 companies, including Zapar, who have already committed to providing their platform either for free or with some discount to the participating teams. So to keep this in mind, every, almost everything we do in XR is contributing in some way to the fight against climate change. And if we can get people to focus their talent, their creativity, their entrepreneurship, maybe even their investments to build and use XR, good things will happen in the world. That's our belief. Hopefully you'll join us in this fight. And uh, now, you know, again, if you have any questions about the competition, feel free to share in the chat. Well, our team is on hand to help you address those questions. We have Dace Campbell, uh, the XR Prize Manager here, and Nathan uh, from the AW team, all ready to help you figure out how to compete and how to, uh, to go about it, all right? But the best way to inspire you guys to join the competition is to show, not tell, right? So that's why we have assembled this uh, fantastic group of projects. Uh, first project is uh, actually from 2007, if you can believe. This is pre-iPhone, uh, and it fits perfectly in the visualized category. So I'm going to stop presenting now. I can, so we can get ready for our presenter. We're lucky to have here uh, the legendary Sean White with us to talk about how he built this project so many years ago and how come no one has built anything like that since then. So that, that's my biggest question. So Sean, whenever you're ready, take it away. Give it up yep. for Sean. Uh, Thanks, Roy. Uh Let's see, I hit the sharing. It should be sharing. There we go. Um, all right, so uh, first, Ori, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's fun to talk about this work, and it, it's something I care very much about, both the, the augmented reality aspects, but even more importantly, the, the fight for climate change. And I think that is the interesting challenge here is how can we use XR, VR, AR to, to fight climate change? It's not obvious. Um, so in my five minutes, I want to share an example of a project called Sight Lens that was one approach that we took to addressing air quality and pollution in the air. I'll talk a little bit about what we did, what we learned, and then maybe a few extra thoughts on the subject, uh, what's changed since then, and maybe some new opportunities. So first, uh, as Ori said, some context and motivation. Uh, this was the work that was published in 2009, but was done in 2007 uh, in New York City. Um, Keep in mind, this is the year that the first iPhone came out. So there really wasn't a whole lot of internet connectivity on phones. It wasn't something that people thought a whole lot about. And we didn't really have portable displays around. Um, Google Maps had started maybe a, a year prior in 2000, uh, two, two years prior in 2005. Um, and so the, the world was really a different place. Um, I also wanted to point out that the work was done um, not just with you know computer scientists, but with uh, uh, Sarah Williams, who's an architect and designer, Petya Morozov, who is uh, a um, uh, urban planner and designer, and a whole host of other stakeholders and people that we worked with, uh, uh, along with uh, Steve Feiner and his lab. And the, the question we were asking, which I think was really interesting and important at the time, was how do we help urban designers, planners, people who are trying to uh, have impact in the things that they create and build, address things like air quality, climate, how do we help them understand the environment? And so we, we started off, uh, and I, I wanted to emphasize this, I think it's important, we actually start off by listening, right? So even though I am a technologist, um, I am a designer just as much. And so we, we went and spent time with them, understanding what it was that they normally do when they go in to try and create a new urban design, a new plan, a new place for people, or, or uh, some kind of activity or intervention. Um, and for the most part, this was going into different locations, talking to people, 
taking photos, you can kind of see examples of this. These were the tools that they used when they were actually trying to understand what the issues were. Um, and what we found is it takes a lot of time to learn those real issues, both for them and for us as we were doing it. But one of the things that was missing was the real timeness of it. That is, they would do all this work and then bring it back to you know, their office or someplace and actually try and understand what that meant. And so what we wanted to do was actually put that information in the place. Um, so we iterated several times on projects and came up with something called Sight Lens. Um, you, you can see a picture of it here and a technique called situated visualization, um, which sounds obvious now, but it was the idea that you take visualization, you take data and you put it in the place in which it's relevant, right? Um, and so I even, Lori was asking me about this. Uh, I mentioned the iPhone just come out, but this is the device. I still have one, it's called a, a Sony Vio. And it was a small handheld computer running Windows. What we found is that we wanted to be able to give them a chance to be in the physical scene and see overlaid things like air quality. And the problem with that was that First, they have to go back to their office to get that information, but that the data was coming from very few sources. Um, that is, for all of Manhattan, it was coming from three different locations. And so we went ahead and uh, built this system. We, uh, it was the combination of uh, an augmented reality system for visualizing. We used AR tag because, uh, frankly, monocular slam had not been invented yet by George Klein. It was going to be another two years from then. Um, and gave them a way to, and also built some uh, mobile sensors where you could walk along and really see the air quality. That is, you sense in a location what the air quality is, what the, uh, in this case, uh, what the carbon monoxide level is, but we also looked at um, particulate matter uh, and use, again, what we call situated visualization to do that. So what that kind of looked like was, uh, this, you would see balls that sort of represent it, but we learned a lot, and so I'll, I'll jump into that because I only have about a minute left, is that the, the interface itself is actually editorial, right? So we found that when we used smoke as a representation of air quality, it meant one thing. When we went, used the height of the balls in terms of air quality, it meant something completely different. And so there is a, there's an editorial process for this. Um, it was important to represent where the data comes from, the provenance. It was important for people to create new data sets and build on those in the activities they were doing. And really it was also important for people, and this is one of the most important things I think for climate action is not just to understand, but then take action. And I've done a number of citizen science projects since then, and the ability to take action after you've done something, not just understood it, but do something about it is incredibly important in the systems we design. And so maybe a few last thoughts, and I realize I'm already out of time, but a lot of that has changed in terms of the infrastructure for display, tracking, sensing data. I think it's important, as Ari said, to really be clear about what augmented reality is good for. I used to teach a class at Stanford where the students would wear watches and glasses, and oftentimes the watch was better for a particular experience than the glasses. You really want to do that here in terms of you know, understanding, uh, as Ari said, visualization or analytics or awareness or even situated action, that thing you can do in the moment. And I think the last part is how does it really help us fight climate change? And I, my sense is probably the most important thing is that you think about the real impact and how to scale it. Uh, I, I was asked by someone earlier about other ways in which we address these and can these things be equitable? And I think at the time, no, it was really hard to even have one device, let alone millions of them. And now we have, you know, hundreds of millions of those devices. So um, I'll leave it with that last thought. I, I would love to actually hear what all of you are working on and what you're interested in. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Awesome. Good job, Sean. Uh, actually, we, we definitely want to hear more. So uh, keep, keep the slides up. Maybe you can kind of talk us uh, through more about, you know, how you actually built it. I guess, like yeah. you said, well, Slam on, on phones wasn't invented then. Uh, there's no Niantic or Snap Land markers or any of that thing. So that's, you use markers, right. I guess, right, to just kind of locate the information in the right place. Yeah. So at the time, the you know the approaches were differential GPS, which you know you put up. It, we used to do this in New York. You put up a system, you get differential GPS, and that actually gives you um, uh, you know a, a much finer grain, but it also interferes with all the taxis around New York, and so they don't like it when you do that. Um, 
uh, you can use fiducial markers and tags, but as I said earlier, um, the, the quality of uh, you know, computer vision and tracking and registration now are much better. I think one of the things that's missing actually uh, is there aren't frameworks that tie the streaming of data to those locations in the way that I think we'd like to see. I think that would actually be really important both in the understanding of the data, but also in taking action around it. Um, you know, we were exceptionally proud because we had built the graphics so that it would have shadows along the sidewalks and things. And part of that was to give people a real visceral sense for the experience. Um, my, my wife wrote her dissertation actually about how we understand large scale change, like uh, geologic time or climatic time or you know, galactic time in our narratives and it's hard for humans, right? It's hard for us to get a sense that anything is changing around us other than when there's a hurricane or some disaster. And so, you know, these representations are, are important for that. Uh, okay, cool. So so what about the data sources? Uh, you said back then yeah. uh, it was just a few, how, how has that changed over time? Um, and is the data, I mean, data about air quality, about pollution, is that more available today? What are the sources that you're aware of and, and how can we get access to it uh, and localize it you know, yeah. around us? No, that's, that's a great question, Ori. So uh, at the time, Sarah Williams was, uh, used to refer to it as the data mafia. Right? Um, I'd also done a number of other uh, projects like Leaf, uh, basically an electronic field guide that uses augmented reality to identify plants around the nature preserves with the Smithsonian. And, each time we'd try and get data, it was almost impossible to get. The same was true with the EPA data back then. A lot of that has changed. Um, there are a lot more APIs for accessing it. Our sensing abilities have changed. I mean, you know, we now have things like synthetic aperture radar bouncing radio waves from space to look through the clouds to see how things are changing. We have optical and IR satellites, and we have a lot more sensors on the ground understanding what's happening. And so that, that's great for things like air quality, but it's also good when we're trying to understand and look at how we model the data. Like Again, uh, 15 years ago, we didn't have the same capability to do simulations and models of what might be happening, whether that is about uh, sea level rise or risk analysis about you know, what's happening with climate. We can do that now. Um, and so, you know, th those capabilities, the combination of both local sensing, satellite and global sensing, and our ability to do simulations, extrapolation, and even, you know, the kind of generative AI that we see a lot now, um, uh, are far and away uh, superior to what we used to have. Um, it would still be nice to have overall frameworks to access that. I'd always like to see more of that opened up so that, they're, you know, that the data mafia gets smaller and smaller. Um, but it's gotten much better. Any idea where to tap into those uh, sources that you mentioned? Uh, sure. Actually, you know, uh, I think that the important thing is find, <laughs> I see someone said Google it. Um, and I, <laughs> right now, that's actually one of the best things because what you want to do is actually understand the source you care about. So, for instance, um, there is a data source here. I, I live in Santa Clara in the Bay Area. Um, I was recently looking at the... Uh, as one does the uh, COVID levels coming out of the sewage, um, and that that data is just easily Googleable now. So uh, I, I would take the problem you're trying to solve. So if you're interested in uh, carbon uh, carbon dioxide levels, or if you are interested in plastic usage, or you are interested in cement, find those things and the the resources that are accessible for that. Another uh, strange side way we, you can do this. Um, they're often uh, data repositories that get collected by some of the classes that teach visualization. So um, if you, you go to those classes, they have done some of the work for you. But in the end, there's still work, there's still data curation that has to happen generally when you are trying to represent these things. Awesome, Sean. Uh, okay, so my, my, the key question that is on everybody's mind, um, if somebody, uh, is planning to build something like this today. Uh, first of all, you know, what tips do you have except for what you already mentioned? And how do you think it could actually impact the fight against climate change? I mean, 
we can probably put it in the hands of millions, not just you know the very few that tested your product, your your project. Uh, how how do you think it could impact, and in what way? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So I, I was thinking about this. You know, you've asked both about how do you go about it, and then you know how it has impact. I think going about it, I I would take you know the iterative design process, which is start with something small, mock it up, try it. Um, you mentioned, you know, there's some fantastic platforms today, uh, Niantic's more recent work. You can place things out in the world and get a sense for what it feels like and how it actually might, you know, change or affect someone's perception. The second part, I think, is just understanding what the leverage points are. And this is true for, you know, a, a research project, a long-term nonprofit for a business is what the points of leverage are. And so, Yes, you know, we can release something that helps everybody understand, maybe even lets them start the discussion or lets them take action. Maybe that's about a vote or a petition or even the conversion into planting a tree or purchasing some kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, carbon offset. Um, you could also work with very specific industries. I mean, one of the things that I, I would love to see, because I know we have the technology now, is we have LiDAR systems that can look at airflow, right? So you can aim LiDAR up into the sky. You can see how the wind and air is moving. That's a perfect way to use augmented reality to actually visualize the best place to put a wind turbine, right? And so there are industries that I think you can help in doing that as well. Uh, and, and a lot of that you know, has been enabled really only in recent years. So I, I, I would take the step of find real problems, iterate on the design and how you're approaching it, use the, a lot of the existing platforms that are there, um, and you know, really focus on where you think those leverage points are. Now we're going to put you on the spot. Uh, would you <laughs> consider actually <laughs> picking up where you left back then and, and building it, or, or maybe you know, coaching or supporting other teams that are interested in taking it on? on? Uh, I'll, I'll say yes to all those things. <laughs> okay. Sean, thanks very, very much. Uh, true pioneer. And, uh, and uh, no, we cannot just look at that and, and say, we have to do it now. We have the technology. We have the data. Let's, let's do it. So thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Ari. Sure. And, and uh, you can stop uh, presenting now. And if, if you have more questions for Sean, feel free to put it, drop it in the chat. Uh, and now we're moving on to our next presenter, uh, also a PhD, of course. Um, and uh, the ne next uh, uh, project is really in the educate category, just to show you the power of XR to educate people and create empathy and help in decision making uh, in a better way that any movie or PowerPoint can do. Uh, give it up for the chief innovation officer and interaction designer at Gagarin and developer of Astrid, Vanessa Julia Carpenter. Take it away, Vanessa. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my presentation here. Here we go. Um, so yeah, thank you for that introduction. I am sitting in Iceland right now, which is where Gagarin is. And I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about what we do. So we work to create experiences, interactive, tangible experiences in museums and public spaces. And what we do is we work with scientists and researchers and all sorts of different people, museum curators, to try and take some really complex information and make it into something that is memorable for people. And so today, of course, we're talking about this huge problem that we have of climate change and how we can use XR to tackle that. And you know what we've experienced is that translating these complex issues into something that works for people is something we've been doing for 27 years at Gagarin. And so now we decided that we wanted to apply that to climate change. And we really think that education is the place to start with this. So um, the problem that we're looking at is on many, many levels. Um, first of all, there's the problem of the educators. So they lack really enough time and the right tools to communicate climate change topics effectively. And then we have the youth. And the youth are experiencing an anxiety worldwide. This has been documented all over the place whenever they're given these horrible situations of here's your climate future, go fix it. You know, it's, it's just really the wrong approach. So then we have the problem of the scientists. Now, scientists are doing some really phenomenal work, but it's not really getting communicated in the right way 
um, to the majority of people. And then we have the problem of the businesses and authorities. And that problem is simply that there's so many new regulations and requirements and everything else in terms of climate change. And it's all happening so fast that people are really trying to figure out, you know, what can I do? And then we have the problem of the planet. The planet will go on. Nature at the end of the day does not care. It will transform into something new. So our challenge here is really to curate a clear narrative about how we can take actions towards a positive climate future. So we see this on seven levels. And basically what we see is we have, you know, the individual here on the one side of the screen, and that's, you know, you and I, and that's all the messages we typically get, such as, hey, you should recycle more, you should travel less, you should switch to an electric car, all these types of things that we should do. But actually there's problems and solutions on all seven levels, everything from our communities and the companies out there to our nations and beyond. So that's why we created Garden of Choices. And Garden of Choices is the first project in a series of projects that we're doing. And it's a virtual reality role-playing game to discuss and debate climate change. So I just wanted to give you a little introduction to this. Hopefully you can hear it okay. Just let me know. We believe there is hope for the future. That's why we created a virtual reality experience to help you navigate the choices we all have to make about our climate futures. Garden of Choices is our VR experience for youth where five people join together in virtual reality to investigate, debate, and ultimately decide together about the actions they think society should take to reduce our carbon footprint. Every decision the group makes has consequences for people, planet, and economy. Find out more at astrid.is. So that gives you a little bit of a glimpse into the gameplay there. And in this game, um, as you saw, five people stand in a circle together and they actually get to speak together and hear each other's commentary. And in this way, they get to learn how to debate and take climate actions together. And this gameplay is based on actual Icelandic policy and climate actions. So there was another thing that was really interesting that came out of our studies, which was that being in virtual reality gave this feeling of anonymity. So even when playing with peers, students felt like this little mask that they have on, you know, the headset was giving them this feeling that they could actually express themselves a little bit more than, you know, like, oh, it's the popular kids over there. And I don't know if I should say this. And, you know, that kind of got erased a little bit. So that was an interesting side of, of being in VR. And what we learned is that by using VR, we're able to more effectively engage youth in learning than in traditional climate change education approaches. And we've tested this with over 300 youth and educators in Scandinavia. And I know a lot of these logos don't make sense, but basically what we have here is, you know, the meteorological agency, the environmental agency. We've been working with scientists and researchers to co-create our product. So all the research, all the knowledge that comes into our product has been co-created not only with the teachers and the youth, but also with all the experts that we have access to. And in doing research, we found out that personally relevant education leads to taking action. So in the game, people are given these personally relevant, interesting stories that they get to work with. And that collaboration and discussion lead to empathy. And so again, we have this collaboration and discussion that they get to take on. And we know that collaboration is the key to brighter climate futures. So that's why we're working with government, municipalities, and businesses alongside researchers, educators, designers, and storytellers. If you visit our Instagram, you can see some of the people that we've been working with and what they're talking about. And just to Finalize here, climate change in VR is providing youth with relevant knowledge, it's facilitating creativity and intuition, it's building bridges between science and design, and it's joining forces between the private and the public sector, which has really been a huge thing, at least here in Iceland so far. So that's it. That's me. A um, little, little bit over time, but uh, thank you so much. For thank you very much, Vanessa. That was fantastic. Um, I, I had the chance to actually try your your project at AWE in Europe in Lisbon uh, with Goopy, which is helping us here behind the scenes, and it was really I mean first of all it was fun, which is the main thing, right? I mean you want to make it not just a boring movie or you know a bunch of facts. It was really fun, well visualizing kind of all the information and and some of the uh, the things you need uh, to make decisions. And, and then I love kind of the the group decision. I love the the scissor hands. That was pretty awesome. 
<laughs> um, love to to get kind of your thoughts on on or what what inspired those, those hands because it was was a very very cool kind of uh, user experience. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, I think just that the idea of of kind of a group of of people, whether they know each other or not, uh, looking at data, observing data in a very uh, you know uh, effective way, and then making decisions on you know what should we do. That, that was a very cool approach. So first of all, kudos for that. Great job. Thank um, you. So yeah, so first, you know, what what kind of inspired those those scissor hands? That's such a great question. And I have to tell you, I actually joined the company after they made that decision. However, I can tell you that one of the things that inspired us was we did a ton of research into what is an avatar and how do people react to avatars and how should it be a realistic avatar? Should it be a human-like avatar or should it be an animal? And we, you know, our team did a huge amount of research into this and they found out that abstract avatars gave people a greater sense of their own identity in the game. So they didn't have to put on a face of a different type of identity. And so we just came up, um, I don't know if you could see in that in that part of the game or if you remember from playing, but your avatar is kind of almost a Picasso-like creature mm -hmm. with these yep. scissor hands. And in that way, it was abstract enough that people can put their own meaning and their own identity into that. That was very cool. Uh, awesome. So. Um... I, I think you know it, it was really a, an efficient way to drive uh, knowledge and, and decision making around kids, you know, in school. How, how do you think we can take that that to a, a more kind of a broader audience? Are you planning to do this? Is this something in your vision, or or just in general? How, how would you approach that in in a in a different way? Yeah, well, I have to say, you know, our audience is very much the thirteen to eighteen year old crowd. That's who we've been developing for for the past few years. Um, but having said that, working with all these different people, I mean, I think we've had every minister in Iceland come and try this and a lot of different companies because we really want to get their input. We've had tons of scientists, tons of researchers, um, everybody from the Environmental Agency and the Marine Institute. And, you know, they bring their colleagues with them because they have such a good time with it. And then we've been at a lot of different conferences as well, where it's been just adults trying it. And you know, even for people who are working within environment or climate or fisheries or whatever else, they're still getting the sensation that they wouldn't normally get from a typical climate change presentation. You know, one of the first thing that happens in the game is that you're presented with, okay, here's this little CO2 bubble. Isn't it cute? Here's all the things that are inside of it. And then it blows up to the size of the room and it says, and yeah. this is one ton of CO2. And, you know, you just get this, that's what we work with at Gagrin, right? This sense of embodiment, this sense of tangibility that you get suddenly, even without touching something, just by this thing filling the room. And, you know, that that doesn't matter if you're 13 to 18 or 70, it's going to have the same effect. Well said. I, I believe Iceland has, what, 300,000 population, right? Yeah. So, so what's, what's your penetration with this uh, project in Iceland? <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good question. We have tested it with so many people. And right now we're working on rolling it out for next fall, hopefully, if all goes well. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been testing it. We've been co-creating with the teachers and the youths, really getting them you know, to be part of actually, OK, it should be more like this or this works better. Um, and I think you know we're based in Reykjavik, but we've also tried it in different parts of the country. And I mean, you. I can't go to any events without people who have heard of it already. So that's pretty nice. It's amazing. Next, uh, the world, right? Definitely. We've already started working in Denmark. That's where I'm based in. I'm based in, normally I'm based in Copenhagen. I'm back and forth between Reykjavik. Um, and yeah, so we've already started talking to people there and testing with youth there as well. Awesome. Vanessa, thank you for joining us today. And thank you for uh, developing this amazing project. Uh, would be happy to uh, show it everywhere and uh, you so you know, the in-person events and online wherever we can. Uh, and good luck with this. We need thank it. You. Save the world, right? So we do need it. You. Yeah, we, we need the education part. So thank you so much for having us tonight. Of course. All right. So uh, if uh, there are any questions for Vanessa, feel free to drop it in the chat, and you can uh, Vanessa, you can answer it right there. Uh, we're moving on to the next presentation which is uh, incidentally uh, focused on the optimized category of the XR prize, meaning uh, using XR to help improve and optimize 
existing solutions to climate change. And we have an, a pretty uh, remarkable uh, project here still in the works. Give it up for CEO of Harvests, Ali Danieli. Take it away, Ali. Hello, thank you, Ori. Appreciate it. Um, let me present my screen here. Hopefully that's sharing. Yeah, here we go. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Ali Daniali. I'm the founder of a company called Harvest, and uh, I'm going to be talking about an application called Farm, and it's specifically for indoor vertical farming. And um, you guys may not have any clue what that is, but I'm going to do a really quick intro of in indoor farming and uh, just a really quick background. The reason I am in Harvest is because I wanted to actually do work in impacting climate change. I left T-Mobile and uh, founded Harvest specifically for tackling the environmental challenges that we're talking about. And have part of that is coming up with a, a platform which I've uh, coined indoor farming as a service, indoor farm as a service that I'm going to talk about uh, and the our application works with. Um, Harvest in general is about indoor farming and bringing it uh, into a world where uh, it uses its capability of saving water, being better for the environment, bringing a lot of different varieties, but connecting buyers and sellers, uh, farmers together. Um, I won't go too far into this, but really it's, we have a platform that uh, is able to see inside of an indoor farm uh, and unlock the capacity of what's happening inside that farm so that it can be quote unquote booked and utilized and aggregated and uh, put uh, together with multiple farms to do lots of uh, different kinds of indoor growing. Uh, what we have in, brought to the market is what we call craft produce, and that's variety. Um, Big Ag, since World War II, has reduced variety for us as consumers. And the saving grace is that small and independent growers are able to bring variety back to our palates. And we can do that in a regenerative and sustainable way um, by producing food indoors at the highest quality. But software is important. And uh, software like our indoor farm as a service, IFAS is what gets to do that. So we have uh, and I'm happy to talk about that at any other time, but we have a whole system that unlocks the, uh, a, a demand and allows a grower to actually grow what has been ordered. We, we tell our growers don't grow until it's pre-sold. And that is part of the reduction of waste that we're looking at. Um, today, traditional growers are do a lot of guesswork and they just grow and hope that it sells and in traditional farming and with indoor farming, you have a way through it because it's controlled in every aspect of it. Every single bit of it is software driven. You can control it with a recipe and make sure that um, you have as much efficiency as possible. So our, our entry into um, the XR challenge is an application called Farm, and it's going to be focusing um, really on unlocking this this mission that we have of tackling uh, the the impact that field farming is is on our planet. Um, there's field farming is degrading our soil. It's poisoning our water through pesticides. It's uh, generating uh, greenhouse gases, and not that we have a solution to grow everything that is grown 
outdoors, indoors, but we're a proponent of making sure that what can be grown indoors is grown at a very high, you know, uh, efficient way and supporting that. So we're, we're, we have an application that increases productivity for the grower by reducing waste in many, you know, from consumables, water, enhancing re resilience, using real-time data, and then, and then ultimately reducing emissions because the grower is much more efficient. So let me introduce you to Farm, and Farm is a an application that's we're we're working as part of the Pathfinder program with Snapdragon Spaces, um, and a partnership that we have with Verde Compacto, which is an indoor vertical farm manufacturer. And here's a picture of uh, of that in the corner. But the focus of this application is to keep the farm performing its daily, weekly, all the, the work that it, that a grower does, that they use their hands um, using a wearable and making their work much more efficient. Uh, and there's a lot that goes on and there's a little video at the end that I'm gonna show you that's representative of what somebody in an indoor farm may be replacing using a wearable and you guys may have never seen inside of an indoor farm and i'm hoping that that video also kind of gives you guys a glimpse into that but there's there's a lot of work that happens and the mapping of an indoor farm whether it's a, a container farm like the verta compactor huffster or a, a vertical farm that's in a big warehouse there's there's a way to map it and when you have a mapped you can then be able to uh, anchor lots of data to different things whether it's the panels or it's the the trees or it's the dosing or all the different iot devices so for example this particular unit this uh, uh vertical farm inside of a shipping container has over 80 different iot devices in it every single bit of that information can be placed in front of the grower at the right time and visualizing and aggregating all that information from from seed to even sales data for a grower is is creates a, a, an environment that they're a lot more efficient in how they they work so kind of really quick um there's there's a lot of impact for one in, in climate change what we're looking at is reducing the water usage, growing food with less fertilizer, um, helping reduce transportation costs and, and then em emissions altogether and using our uh, wearable solution with uh, this XR app, it helps the grower be be become a lot more efficient in their work. Um, and from lo locating specific things like a certain uh, planting or being able to uh, do things like spacing um, on a, in a vertical farm when you're planting seeds in, in a panel, the spacing is important based on what kind, if it's lettuce versus cilantro, you can do lots of different spacing. So the quote unquote wayfinding and spacing is important to to being more efficient with your resources. Instead of guessing, you can have a, an XR app showing you. Um, what I wanted to really drive home here is that this type of work is compounds the savings. So we're looking at rolling out this solution to 100 indoor farms and the amount of food that can be generated at 100 indoor farms is staggering. And then when you look at in comparison to traditional field farming, that much food, you're saving 45 million gallons of water per year. And being more efficient it incrementally is, is what we're talking about. We're tactical. We want, we want to build solutions that today a grower can 
put in in place and it is an enterprise type of solution but day to day week by week month by month provide value for uh, growers so uh, we, we will be in Las Vegas in February and and we'll be showing this application with Verde Compacto um, in Las Vegas so if you're in you do happen to come to Indoor AgCon, um, please come. We have a booth there. Um, and then uh, if I could have the video run. We were kind of running out of, out of time, but yeah, let, let's play the video. So yeah, it's real quick. Goofy, you got the video? that and can you play the video Luffy? no yeah it, it doesn't work for some reason sorry all right that's all right okay. we can we can skip the never video. mind anyway ali uh fantastic love your project and love the use of ar in this project so cool thank you very much thank you uh, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but uh, kind of my main question is, you know, um, uh, the, the use of AR in this in this project. Do, do you feel it's it's uh, going to optimize the work of the farmer? Uh, and if so, you know, do you have like an estimation of the percentages, or is it actually allowing the farmer to do things they could not do at all without the AR and IoT technology? Both. Uh, right now, the the process is a clipboard. Um, the the grower is constantly using a clipboard doing their daily tasks. So removing the clipboard is paramount in, in, in speeding up their work. The Also, the less that a grower has to go inside their farm, better, because it, it uh, keeps the, the temperatures and the humidity and all the environmentals uh, better. So you don't have to keep opening and closing it if you have a wearable that you can see information, uh, kind of a digital twin of what you're you're going to be working in. So there's and then the things that you can't do today is about uh, is all related to unlocking the data that's being produced from the farm um, and being able to make decisions faster uh, or not having to go back to your PC and be able to figure it out. But being able to be right there and making those decisions, if you see a certain kind of problem with your plant, you see you know, burning, what are you gonna change in your recipe? What are you going to change with the humidity? Um, or being able to visualize that half of your, your container might, or your, your farm has some problems with temperature and be able to correct that. Awesome, Ali. Um, there's, uh, I see some more questions in the chat, so feel free to answer. Uh, it looks like Sean is, is looking for some examples of how the, the, AR the great thing about help. indoor farming is you don't have to use pesticides. That means the, the bugs are not there. And that's one of the, the, the great things, Sean, is that, um, that indoor farming is, is a better in, compared to traditional uh, growing. All right, Ali, thanks very much. Fantastic Thank you. Project. Uh, can't wait to actually install it in my house. Sounds like a, a dream, uh, mm -hmm. a dream come true. Uh, all right, folks, we're uh, down to our uh, last but not least uh, presenter for today. And, and this is a really special one. It's an AR hardware company that is taking, that is spearheading the fight against climate change with their glasses, uh, building an AR tracker for a uh, carbon footprint. So give it up for the founder of Third Eye, Nick Cherikuri. Take it away, Nick. We don't see you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm trying to share my screen right now. It's giving me, it's not letting me present. Oh, let me see, try. Yeah, I'm clicking the present now. Uh, Oli, would you be able to, uh... Uh, stop sharing your screen, Ali. There you go. All right, now I can share it. Cool. All right, let me 
One second, please. Let me share screen. Awesome. So you all can see this screen, hopefully. Um, so yeah, today we wanted to talk about some of the use cases of uh, what we're doing using AR for environmental sustainability use cases. Uh, some quick background about who we are. Third Eye, we've been developing this tech for the US military for, for about 20 plus years. Um, and we've developed our multiple glasses and the ones I have around my neck are the X2 glasses. We have different versions for different use cases. And we really want to focus on how this can be used to help companies achieve their ESG standards. Uh, so what we're seeing is a lot of the B2B companies uh, and even the government, they have ESG goals and what AR, especially the remote teleconferencing solutions enable these companies to do is to reduce their carbon emissions and carbon footprints, visualize 3D holograms of any machinery, any uh, objects where they don't need to actually physically buy the object, but they can visualize it as a 3D hologram via the glasses, eliminate the need for unnecessary employee travel to on-site locations. So whereas before a senior expert may have had to fly on site to train a junior uh, worker, now anyone can be wearing the glasses or be using an AR teleconferencing tool and get the remote assistance they need, be able to pull up any PDF information, any work documents. And this is really helping a lot of uh, different companies not only uh, save a tremendous amount in cost savings, but also help emit, reduce their carbon emissions. And we created this ROI calculator, which I'll share the link uh, in the chat after. And with this ROI calculator, this basically is a carbon emissions calculator for any company to use to see how much ROI they would save for their uh, work and also calculate their estimate of carbon emissions saved. So this is something that they can show by utilizing augmented reality, they can help reduce carbon emissions. So one example of this is uh, the US military. They're using this across several bases in Hawaii, as well as the US ARPAC, which manages a lot of the West Coast uh, use uh, bases. And they were using the remote conferencing tool on the glasses. So as you'll see in this picture, this is a member of the armed forces with the glasses, uh, basically visualizing a 3D hologram via the glasses. And they found nearly 40% operating efficiencies. This is in terms of re improved training times, tremendous reduced travel savings. So a senior expert does not need to, need to travel on site. So instead of going everywhere on site, now you could have one senior expert sitting in front of their computer in a main command center, and you could have maybe 15 or 20 junior uh, lower uh, skilled employees wearing the glasses and have them have the remote expert help train them. And they were also visualizing 3D holograms of machinery and objects for training purposes. <clears throat> so this is where, and this is not just for the military, but also for universities and healthcare, where for training purposes, you may not need to buy the physical equipment anymore, but you can visualize the 3D holograms uh, for training purposes. So imagine how much reduced costs that would be, as well as uh, waste inputs where uh, you don't need to buy the physical product, but now you can visualize it as a 3D hologram via the AR glasses. So we saw the main benefits for ESG uh, were reduced travel. AR will have a tremendous impact for that, especially for any company with, with field workers. And roughly 80% of the global workforce are some type of on the field uh, workers that use their hands. So AR will have a tremendous impact for them. And then also by visualizing 3D holograms of any machinery or any objects. So this will also help and reduce a lot of the uh, material waste and allow uh, you to visualize 3D holograms via the glasses and not need to physically buy the object. So that's some of the main benefits we saw. And some numbers we uh, saw were also that the transportation sector is the largest contributor 
to U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, especially in the U.S. So by eliminating the, the need for a lot of the travel for many organizations, you can help deal with probably the largest ca cause of greenhouse gas emissions. And especially a lot of the travel we saw during COVID was reduced. And during the pandemic, there was an acceleration for the need for AR because now people couldn't travel in person and they were using tools like ours to uh, and many others to help solve the needs. So I think even with remote work going down, AR will still be a major part of uh, how society deals with remote work and enabling a disparate workforce to interact with each other. So those are just some of the high level benefits we saw that how AR could be useful. And it's not just for one industry, we've seen this for universities, for hospitals, for EMTs, obviously the military. So uh, I think this AR tech will keep growing and will keep having a bigger impact on helping uh, address uh, environmental uh, carbon emissions in a positive way. Uh, so yeah, that was just a high level highlight and uh, happy to share more information uh, with everyone as well. All right, thank you very much, Nick. That's very cool stuff and impressive numbers. Uh, which don't surprise me, but I guess it's good to to convince many other uh, skeptics out there or people that are just not aware of these possibilities. Now, you also talked about a carbon footprint tracker. Is, is that kind of just a, a, a concept that uh, kind of mentions all the different use cases in which AR and the glasses can help? Or, or is there an actual tracker that can track the effects of... Uh, a green gas uh, emissions for for a company for an industry. Yes, so we developed a carbon emissions tracker as part of our remote teleconferencing AR software, where it calculates the amount of calls you do using AR, and then using a uh, calculation, it gives an estimation of the amount of carbon emissions you saved by using AR. So instead of the senior expert having to fly on site or drive on site everywhere. Maybe they do 50 calls using the glasses with different devices, and that helps reduce the organization's uh, carbon emissions footprint. So we do offer a number via our software that uh, uh, we're happy to uh, show. All right. Awesome. Nick, uh, I'm sorry we, we're kind of out of time, uh, but if there are any questions, uh, people, where, where can people find you? Sure. They can find me at Nick Cherikuri on Twitter or all social media, and we also just share Third Eye Gen our website. So feel free to reach out. Our team is happy to talk anytime. Awesome. So, folks, that brings us to the end of the session today. Let's bring up all our speakers. Give them a big, big round of applause. Sean, thank you very much for joining us. Vanessa, so late in Iceland, we appreciate it. Happy to Amir be here. And Nick. Um, any final questions uh, or kind of final words from each one of you before we conclude? John? I, 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 I'm just really looking forward to seeing. May, I'll volunteer to judge just so I can see all of the cool projects that are coming out. You got it. We got it's it really camera. fascinating to see all the all the different people working in this area. I mean, we're working with education, but there's so many different ways that we can be flighting, flighting. it's late fighting climate change with uh, XR. So it's super nice to see that. Ali? Yep. Uh, thank you, Ori, for giving us the space to talk about it. Awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Ori. And uh, there's so many different ways to help fight climate change. So yeah. we're all excited to be part of it. It's really awesome to have you all on this fight. And we hope this uh, session will inspire more people to join this fight. Yes. There's yes. nothing more important than, than doing this fight in the next couple of decades. And again, the good news is that this is the biggest economic opportunity. So, you know, you get the best of both worlds. And, and that's why we've put a $100,000 prize on this. If you want to learn more about this prize or participate, go to uh, awexr.com slash xrprize. We'd love to see your submissions. If you have questions, uh, post it there as well. And we can try to match you with other teams, with coaches, with experts. We're going to make this happen, say. folks. Yeah, Rory, if, if anybody's interested in working on a uh, farm, let me know. Uh, please do reach out. Um, I am. Yeah. All right, great. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.